We'll start first with the recitation of the ayah of Shafa. There are many in our communities who are in difficulties, who have problems, many who are sick, many actually who are undergoing some surgery and procedures. So we will recite the ayah of Shafa for their quick recovery and may Allah relieve all of these people with all their issues and problems. And of course, we also pray for the people across the world in many different countries who are facing oppression and tyranny. So together we will recite the ayah of Shafa five times, please. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amma yujibu al-mustar iza da'ahu wa yakshifu su. Amma yujibu al-mustar iza da'ahu wa yakshifu su. أما يجيب المصدر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصدر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المصدر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء سلوات بالله محمد وعلى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع المذنبين وخاتم النبيين نبينا وشفينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا عبد القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فإليك يا رب نسبت وجهي وإليك يا رب مددت يدي فبعزتك استجب لدعائي وبلغني مناية ولا تقطع من فضلك رجائي واكفني شر الجن والإنس من عدائي يا سريع الرضا اغفر لمن لا يملك إلا الدعاء فإنك فعال لما تشاء يا من اسمه دواء وذكره شفاء وطاعته غنى إرهام من رأس ماله الرجاء وسلاؤه البقاء يا صابغ النعام يا دافع النقام يا نور المستوحشين في الظلم يا آل من لا يعلم صل على محمد وآل محمد وافعل بي ما أنت أهل وصلى الله على رسوله والعيمة الميامين من آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا صلى الله أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وهو أصدق الصادقين وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى سرات العزيز الحميد آمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم سلوات بالله محمد وآل محمد أعظم الله أجورنا وأجوركم بمسابنا بعبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Respected scholars, elders of the community, my brothers and sisters in Islam سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته We have been discussing with our theme on spiritual elevation and the spiritual and ethical dimensions of Karbala. And we have used the ayah of Surah Ibrahim as one of our themes. 
the ayah that talks about the responsibility of the prophets and the imams being one where they are supposed to take out the ummah, they are supposed to take us out from darkness into the bliss of enlightenment. And we talked over the last few nights about how that process unfolds with respect to perfections. Perfections in the area of how you perfect your relationship with your inner self, how you perfect your relationship with the world, and how you perfect your relationship with society. And we said that in order to do that, you need to purify yourself because the ultimate goal is to get the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is to journey towards the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we said that in order to do that, we need to purify our nafs, we need to purify our intellect and aql, and we need to purify our moral and ethical behavior. And that is how we end up with spiritual elevations. We also talked about the barriers against the elevation spiritually, and also yesterday we touched upon how after purging our hearts and cleansing our hearts, we may be able to adorn it with sabr and shukr in order for us to be able to elevate to a status where we are in the proximity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today I want to move forward in that spiritual elevation and how we attain that spiritual elevation. But before I do that, I think it is important that I define spirituality for you. And I know that initially this will be a little bit heavy, but I want you to just remain with me. I want you to focus and remain with me. I'm going to try and make it as simple as I possibly can so that the youngsters also are able to understand what I'm trying to say. The question that a lot of people ask is, what is exactly spirituality? What do you mean by a spiritual person? Who is a spiritual person? Now, we have some very wishy-washy definitions of spirituality that go around. You know, for some people, spirituality is the ability to see visions. It's the ability to have certain dreams. For some people, spirituality means that they would have certain powers that they didn't have before and they have certain things that they can do that other people are unable to do. For others, spiritual, spirituality is an emotion. It is a feeling that they have. There are many people, for example, who will tell you that when I listen to music, I feel spiritual. A lot of people, especially the non-Muslim community, will say to you that when I listen to music, I feel spiritual. Some people will say when I do meditation, I feel very spiritual. And some people also will say to you that, for example, when I do martial arts, it's a means of spirituality for me. It feels very spiritual for me. So the question is, what is spirituality according to Islam? Because if I'm talking about spirituality all these nights, it's important that we understand what is spirituality in the most easiest way that we possibly can. So the way to explain it is that, you know, the way we know things, the way we have knowledge of things, is either through concepts or constructs, right? We know something because we have a concept of it in our mind. It's called conceptual knowledge, right? It's knowledge based on concepts. Let me give you an example that the youngsters will understand first, right? So if you do mathematics, right, if you do maths in school, you are taught concepts, right? They will tell you what a triangle is, right? So in order for you to understand what a triangle is, you have a concept of a triangle in your mind. You develop a concept of a triangle in your mind, and that's how you know what a triangle is. For some of us older people, for example, if you take, for example, a car, and if I was to tell you, you know, do you know what a car is? Well, you have an image and a concept of a car that gives you that knowledge of what a car is. It's called conceptual knowledge. Right? So that's one type of knowledge. Now, sometimes what happens is that even what we have as far as the existence of God is concerned, 
the existence of Allah is concerned, the oneness of Allah is concerned, the Tawheed is concerned, we have developed a concept of Allah in our minds. We have an image of Allah in our mind. If somebody wants to talk to you about the justice of Allah or the mercy of Allah, then you have a concept of justice in your mind and you have a concept of mercy in your mind. And that is how you try and relate yourself to what Allah is. We develop this concept in our minds, even of God, even of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there is another type of knowledge. And this knowledge is called experiential knowledge. Now we are not talking about concept. You are talking about an experience. You experience something and that is how you gain knowledge. So for example, your own existence that you currently exist is experiential. Yeah? It's not a concept. You are actually experiencing it. Man, I got to tell you, are you lost? Are you lost? Are you with me? I'm trying to make this really easy, right? So experiential knowledge is, you know, something that you experience. The, another example that I can give, you know, is, for example, pain. When somebody has pain, it's not a conceptual knowledge, right? It's something that that person experiences, right? It won't be able to describe to you what pain is. It's an experiential knowledge. So there is conceptual knowledge and there is experiential knowledge. Now think about it. What if we were able to convert our concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the conceptual knowledge to actually experience experiencing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within ourselves. Moving from conceptual knowledge, in Islam it's called ilm, into experiential knowledge, which Islam is called iman, that is spirituality. Moving from the concept of Allah and the oneness of Allah, and then going into experiencing the oneness of Allah, that is spirituality. That is what we want to try and achieve. That is what we want to do. Now the question is, how do we do that? How do we move from ilm to iman? How do we move from conceptual knowledge to experiential knowledge? The only way to move from conceptual knowledge to experiential knowledge is by performing good deeds. Allama Tabatabai says this, by the way. Amal al-Salihun is the only way that you can move from conceptual knowledge into experiential knowledge. This is the relationship between Islamic ethics and Islamic spirituality. This is the relationship between akhlaq and irfan, if you want to use the word irfan. I don't like using the word irfan because irfan means very different things to people. And I get a little bit worried sometimes, you know, when people interpret it different ways. But that's what it is, right? It is actually moving from conceptual to experiential knowledge through the performance of good deeds. How do you perform these good deeds? The more you manifest the attributes and names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yourself, the more you will experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yourself. That is very important to understand. Right? The more you show love to others, the more you show love to the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you will experience the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yourself. The more you show mercy to your family, for example, and to your friends, the more you will experience the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within yourself. That is spirituality. If you are at home 
and you are oppressive towards your wife, right? For example, or if the wife is oppressive towards their husband, trust me, that happens too, right? Then there is very little chance for you to be able to attain a level of spirituality because you will not be able to experience the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what you see in Karbala. Karbala was a brilliant example of manifestation of mercy by Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salatu was salam. You know, if you look at the maqatil, you know, you will see that Imam alayhi salam in Karbala at different points he would give different sermons and he would admonish the people, you know, the army of Yazid. But he was very, very disturbed physically. He was disturbed to see that the Muslims of that time were deviated with the attachments of the world towards the ideology of Yazid. It really hurt the Imam. If you see some of the khutbat that he's given, it shows the pain that he's going through. He did not want these people to be deviated because he was a manifestation of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the fields of Karbala. He wanted these people to change. He wanted these people to reform. He wanted to transform their hearts. That is why he is called as the manifestation of mercy in Karbala. It is very important, you know, to understand that superficial spirituality, you know, based on emotions, for example, it goes away just as quickly as it comes. When people say, well, I feel very spiritual when I listen to music or when I meditate, or when I do martial arts or something, once that music is turned off, that spirituality goes. It's only transient, it doesn't stay. But the spirituality that I'm talking about, where you start to manifest the attributes of Allah within yourself, that spirituality is ingrained in you. It becomes foundational in you until a time when it becomes a state in your heart and everything you do, you start to feel the presence of Allah within yourself. And as you elevate yourself even higher with respect to spiritual elevation, and as you start to manifest more and more names and attributes of Allah within yourself, and then when these names and attributes integrate with each other, that is when you reach that high stage of spiritual elevation called fana. It is when you have conviction now. Now you are totally dissolved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Completely dissolved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the extent that your actions... And even your thoughts for the people like the holy imams, their actions and even their thoughts are not in their control anymore. They are controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You manifest so all the attributes of Allah within yourself to the highest possible level like the imams did. And at that stage, all your actions and even your thoughts now are in the control of control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you reach a stage where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifests himself in you. I know it's heavy. I know. But it's important to understand. It's important to understand. And we will give an example. Let's start, you know, uh, um, with the ayah of Quran. Ayah of Quran, Surah Al-Anfal, Ayat number 17. فَلَمْ تَقْتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
وما رميت إز رميت ولكن الله رمى. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet, You did not kill them. It was I who killed them. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Holy Prophet, O Prophet, You did not throw the stone at them. It was I who threw the stone at them. You see how Allah is saying to the Holy Prophet, Holy Prophet carried out an act. He threw the stone at the enemies. But Allah says, you did not do it. I did it. Allah is now manifesting himself in the Holy Prophet. Allahu Akbar. Spiritual elevation at its highest. وَمَا يَنْتِكُوا عَنِ الْحَوَى إِنْ لَهُ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Najm, right? He says... That the Holy Prophet, he does not speak. Whatever he says are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are wahi. وَمَا يَنْتِكُوا عَنِ الْحَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوهَى To the extent now that the totality of the being of that person is immersed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is now Allah who is manifesting himself in his creation in his wali this is what awliya are. this is the definition of the awliya this is the quality of the awliya right now the best examples that i can give you about this this level of spiritual uh, elevation because we have to try and achieve this level of spiritual elevation huh? we should be able to achieve this level to the same capacity that we have. Of course, we may not be able to get the capacity of the Imams and the Prophets, but we can certainly try and achieve it to the level that we can. Why not? We can achieve this level as much as our capacity would allow us to achieve. It's very important to understand this. And the best example that I want to use in the lecture today is the example of Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi You know people have viewed Amirul Mu'mineen through many different angles right Some people view Imam Ali through his justice Some people view Imam Ali through his kindness some people view Imam Ali through his knowledge. Some people view Imam Ali through his leadership. Some people view Imam Ali through his compassion. People view Abi Ali ibn Abi Talib through many different lenses. This is the beauty of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is such a balanced individual that any virtue that you want, you just have to look at Ali. Any virtue that you want, you will see that he is at the peak of that virtue. You want to think about worship? Look at the worship of Ali. You want to think about leadership? Look at the leadership of Ali. You want to think about the bravery and the courage? Look at the courage of Ali. This is the most balanced individual that you will find who is totally manifesting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within himself. Now, if you look at Ali and his level of elevation, you will see Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli, he has a book. And he talks about the Gnostic life, the mystic life of Amir al Mu'mineen, the mystic life of Ali. He says it is wrong to look at Ali through philosophy and through theology. The best way to look at Ali is through mysticism, because his life was a life full of mysticism. And this is why Amir al Mu'mineen has said, he says, you know, I worship Allah because he deserves to be worshipped. I don't worship Allah because of the, uh, because of the worship of the, the traders, the worship of the business people. They worship Allah because they want his Jannah. They want favors from Allah. And I don't worship Allah as, as Allah is worshipped by the slaves. Because they worship Allah because they have the fear of Jahannam. I worship Allah because worshipping Allah is 
is de he is deserving of the worship. He is deserving of the worship, and because of his blessings and and benevolence, I worship him because he deserves the gratitude of worship from me. This is Amirul Mu'minin. And this is why Amirul Mu'minin says that everything that I do, I see Allah before it, I see Allah during it, and I see Allah after it. Look at how immersed Amirul Mu'minin is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, a man came to Amirul Mu'minin and he said, Oh Ali, have you seen your Lord? And the reply of Amirul Mu'minin was, Do you think I would worship a Lord that I have not seen? Allahu Akbar. Look at the reply of Amirul Mu'mineen. Do you think I would worship a Lord that I have not seen? And Ali is saying, I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not with the eyes. I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eyes of my heart. I see Allah, I hear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the ears of my heart. I feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times. You know, then he says something beautiful. He says, if Allah had not warned us about disobeying him. See, sometimes we disobey Allah because Allah has warned us. Right? So we disobey, you know, we don't disobey him because of the warning that he has given us, the admonition that he given us. And he says that even if Allah had not warned us, to disobey him, I would still obey him because of the gratitude and the blessings that he has given. See, for Ali, it doesn't make any difference whether there is Jahannam or whether there is Jannah. This is how immersed he is in Allah. And look at how he now exemplifies to us this level of spiritual elevation that I'm talking about. There is an incident when Ali ibn Abi Talib is at the height of his relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is also at the height of his relationship with the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is when he is in the state of salah. He is in the state of salah and somebody comes, a beggar comes to the mosque. And when that beggar comes to the mosque, he asks... He asks if there is anybody to help him. And nobody says anything. He asks the second time, is there anybody to help him? And nobody says anything. And the third time he says that, Oh Allah, I came empty-handed to your house and now I'm leaving empty-handed. At that time, Amirul Mu'mineen, he, he took his hand and he put his hand out and he, he signaled to this man to take that ring from his hand. By the way, this is listed in the narrations of the Shia as well as our brothers in Ahl Sunnah. So this is not just the Shia narrations. He takes out his hand and that particular beggar looked at the hand of Ali and he was signaling to that particular beggar to take the ring from his hand. He takes the ring and he goes away. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the peak at this worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the peak at him looking at the needs of humanity in one state. Same state. You know, the question that a lot of people ask, of course, is how did Ali hear the voice of this beggar? How did he hear? Because this is the same Ali, eh? When he used to have an arrow pierced in his leg, they used to say, wait until Ali goes in the state of Salat. And when he was in the state of Salah, they would take out the arrow and Ali ibn Abi Talib would not even feel it. So this man who would not feel an arrow being taken out from his leg when he is in the state of Salah, how is it that he heard this beggar begging whilst he was in the state of Salah and then he signals to him and he gives him the ring? 
In order to understand this, Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli says in this book of the Gnostic life of Ali, you have to understand what I just explained for the last 5, 15, 20 minutes. In order to understand this, you have to understand that for a perfect man, like Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, for a perfect man like him, being in the state of Salah is the most intimate and close proximity that he has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the Salat is the Mi'raj of a believer, right? As Salatu Mi'raj al Mu'min. Salat is the Mi'raj of a believer. And Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli says that Ali ibn Abi Talib had gained so much proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that at that point his sensory organs, like his eyes and his ears, and his locomotive organs, like his arms and his legs, they were now not in his control anymore. They were in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it was like the Allah says in the Quran to the Holy Prophet, you did not throw that stone. I threw it. You did not kill. I killed. This is what Ali is telling you. It is not him who is giving that ring in the state of ruku. It is the wali of Allah who is giving that, that ring in the state of the ruku. Now Allah is manifesting himself through Ali ibn Abi Talib. And you see, there is another narration that you see Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli narrates this in his book. You know, once the Holy Prophet was given two camels. And he was given two camels. And the Holy Prophet basically went to his companions. These were beautiful camels. And he went to his companions and he said that whoever prays two rakat of salat, observing you know, the necessary laws of reciting Salat, right? The fiqh component. Observing the Sharia with absolute humility and without having any distractions for any worldly thoughts. So pray Salat, observing the necessary laws of Salat, absolute humility, and without any worldly thoughts, then I will give him one of these two camels. Challenge to the companions of the Holy Prophet. The companions of the Holy Prophet thought to themselves, Bana, this is a problem. Because they were all aware of their salats. Just as we are, eh? Because if the mind deviates, Wallah, it deviates in the salat. You forget something, recite Salat, you will remember it. So none of the companions wanted to take up this challenge. The only person who took up this challenge was Amirul Mu'mineen. He said to the Holy Prophet, no problem, I will recite. So the Holy Prophet said, okay Ali, you recite. So Ali ibn Abi Talib recited two rakat of Salat. After reciting the two rakat of Salat, Jibreel came down. Jibreel came down and he said to the Holy Prophet, O oh, Holy Prophet, Allah has said, give one camel to Ali. So the Holy Prophet said to Jibreel, hold on a minute. He said, my condition was that there would be no worldly thought in your mind. And I think that when Ali was in Tashahud, when he was ending his Salat, he had a thought in his mind. He was wanting the camel that was fatter rather than the camel that was thinner. So how can I give the camel to Ali? And Jibreel says to the Holy Prophet, Oh Holy Prophet, 
He said that the thought that you are talking about that Ali had in Salat was not his thought. It was divine thought. It was the thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah was saying that he wanted the fatter camel to go to Ali because he wanted, he knew that Ali was going to take that camel and he was going to distribute the meat of that camel to the poor. Therefore, give the camel to Ali. The Prophet wept. The Prophet wept. Ayatollah Jawadi Amuli's book, The Gnostic Life of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Holy Prophet wept, and the Holy Prophet gave both the camels to Amirul Mu'mini. And he slaughtered both of them, and he distributed the meat of both of them to the people. Let me just say something in Urdu. And then, inshallah, I will come back to English. Salawat pa'ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. I just want to explain this in Urdu. Imam wo hai, ke ek hi vakht mein, do me'raj ke upar kamil hai. Do me'raj hai. Ek namaz apni me'raj pe hai, aur sakhawat apni me'raj pe hai. یہ ہے امیر المؤمنین علی نماز پر رہے ہیں ایک سائل آتا ہے کہتا ہے ہے کوئی جو میری مدد کر سکے کوئی کسی نے مدد نہیں کی دوسری دفعہ سائل کہتا ہے ہے کوئی جو میری مدد کر سکے کسی نے مدد نہیں کی تیسری دفعہ سائل کہتا ہے کہ یا اللہ تیرے گھر خالی آیا تھا اب تیرے گھر سے خالی جا رہا ہوں جب یہ صدا بلند ہوئی تو ایک مرتبہ اس نے دیکھا کہ جو نماز لیڈ کر رہا ہے اس کا ہاتھ نکلا ہاتھ آگے نکلا اور علی ابن ابی طالب نے اشارہ کیا اشارہ کیا سائل نے انگوٹھی کو اتارا انگوٹھی کو لیا اور سائل چل بسا سائل چل بسا انگوٹھی کو اٹھایا اور وہاں سے چلا گیا اللہ کو یہ اتنا پسند آیا کہ اللہ قرآن میں کہتا ہے انما ولیکم اللہ و رسولہ والذین آمنوا الذین یقیمون الصلاة و یوتون الزکاة و ہم راکعون اللہ ولایت پہ وہ فائز ہے ولایت پہ وہ لوگ فائز ہے جو حالت رکو میں زکاة دیتے ہیں ولایت پہ وہ فائز ہے جو حالت رکو میں زکاة دیتے ہیں اب میں آپ کو کہتا ہوں دنیا اعتراض تو کرتی ہے اور علی ابن عبی طالب کے اوپر تو سب اعتراض کریں گے دنیا اعتراض تو کرتی ہے کہ بدن سے تیر نکل گیا نماز کی حالت میں اور علی کو پتہ بھی نہیں چلا بدن سے تیر نکل گیا نماز کی حالت میں علی کو پتہ نہیں چلا اب یہ مجھے بتاؤ کہ علی کو پتا نہیں چلا بدن سے تیر نکل گیا سائل کی آواز علی نے کیسے سن لی سائل کی آواز علی نے کیسے سن لی لیکن میرے خیال سے آپ نے غور نہیں کیا آپ نے غور نہیں کیا کیونکہ جب سائل نمازیوں سے پوچھ رہا تھا تو نہ علی نے سنا نہ علی نے انگوٹھی دی پہلی دفعہ سائل کہتا ہے ہے کوئی جو میری مدد کر سکے نہ علی نے سنا نہ علی نے انگوٹھی دی دوسری مرتبہ سائل کہتا ہے ہے کوئی جو میری مدد کر سکے نہ علی نے سنا نہ علی نے انگوٹھی دی تیسری مرتبہ سائل کہتا ہے یا اللہ تیرے گھر خالی آیا تھا اب تیرے گھر خالی ہاتھ جا رہا ہوں اب سائل اللہ کو پوچھ رہا ہے اب وہ سائل کی آواز وہاں پہنچی ہے جہاں نفس علی پہلے سے موجود ہے یہ نعرہ نعرہ نہیں ہے واللہ یہ نعرہ نہیں ہے
سبحان اللہ اللہ آپ کو سلامت لکھے دیکھو میں ایک بات کہہ رہا ہوں ہم نے وقت میں گنجائش نہیں لیکن ایک بات آپ سے کہہ رہا ہوں کہ ایک مرتبہ یا علی کہنا اللہ اکبر ایک مرتبہ یا علی کہنا دل کی گہرائیوں سے اور معرفت امیر المؤمنین سے ایک مرتبہ یا علی کہنا ختم قرآن کا ثواب رکھتا ہے اب یہ اب مجھے یہ مت پوچھنا کہ یہ کون سی کتاب میں لکھا ہے یہ میرے دل کی کتاب میں لکھا ہے لیکن اس کی دلیل ہے میرے پاس یہ میرے دل کی کتاب ہے لیکن اس کی دلیل ہے میرے پاس کل آگ باہر رہا کہ مجھے مت پوچھا یہ کون سی کتاب میں لکھا ہے تم نے کہا تم کہاں سے لا یہ میرے دل کی کتاب میں نے کہیں نہیں پڑھا ہے یہ میرے دل کی کتاب ہے لیکن اس کی دلیل ہے میرے پاس کیونکہ علی بن عبی طالب خود فرماتے ہیں کہ اگر سارے قرآن کو سمیٹھنے میں آئے اللہ اکبر سارے قرآن کو اگر آپ سمیٹھ لے تو وہ ایک سورہ الحمد میں آ جاتا ہے سارے سورہ الحمد کو آپ سمیٹھ لے تو ایک بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم میں آ جاتا ہے سارا بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم کو آپ سمیٹھ لے تو وہ بائے بسم اللہ میں آ جاتا ہے اگر بائے بسم اللہ کو آپ سمیٹھ لے تو اس نکتے پہ آ جاتا ہے جو بے کے نیچے ہوتا ہے اور امیر المؤمنین کہتے ہیں انا نکتت تحت البا بے کے نیچے جو نکتا ہے وہ میں ہوں میں محمد سے اتنا چھوٹا ہوں جتنا نکتہ بے سے چھوٹا ہے کیونکہ بے سے مراد محمد ہے نکتے سے مراد میں ہوں علی کہتے ہیں ہوں محمد سے اتنا چھوٹا جتنا نکتہ بے سے چھوٹا ہوتا ہے لیکن ہوں اتنا ضروری کہ اگر نکتے کو ہٹا دیا جائے بے کا پتہ نہیں چلتا اگر مجھے ہٹا دیا جائے تو معرفت رسالت نہیں ہو سکتا مولا آپ کو سلامت رکھے یا علی کہنے والوں کو سلامت رکھے اس لیے تو شاعر کہتا ہے سخی وہی ہے جو سائل کو رد و گد نہ کرے سخی وہی ہے جو سائل کو رد و گد نہ کرے کرے سوال جو کوئی تو اسے رد نہ کرے میں اعتراض تیرا کیسے مان لوں وائز علی علی نہیں رہتا اگر مدد نہ کرے The Gnostic life of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Understand how spiritual elevation can happen and how we can attain spiritual elevation. And you see the same thing with Imam Ali alayhi salam in the Battle of Khandak, right? You know, we tell this particular uh, you know, event to our children in Madrasa, right? They all know this event, right, in Madrasa. And the event is, you know, that when Amir al-Mu'mineen was in Khandak, he was fighting Amr bin Abdawad. Amr bin Abdawad was a warrior of that time, right? He was the most feared man of that time. Look at the challenge eh, that Amr bin Abdawad gives to the people. Amr bin Abdawad gives a challenge to the people. Eh? Ali Walji wanted me to recite history, so tell him I'm reciting history for him. Eh? Amir al Mu'minin is fighting Amr bin Abdawad. Amr bin Abdawad, look at the challenge he's giving to the people. His challenge is, he's saying to them, he says, look, come and fight with me. Because according to your own belief system, if you fight with me, you are going to go to Jannah. He says, if you kill me, then you'll go to Jannah. You've done jihad, you've killed me, you'll go to Jannah. And he says, if I kill you, You'll be martyred. You will go to Jannah. So it's a win-win situation for you. Come and fight with me. And the history tells us, when the Holy Prophet says to people, who is going to go and fight Amr bin Abdawad, the people were sitting so still, this is I'm talking from history, eh? 
they were sitting so still that it was as if that if there was a pigeon on their head, if there was a kabutar on their head, that, you know, a little bit of movement and it would fly away. That is how still they were sitting, because they didn't want any movement and Prophet would say, okay, you, come, let's go. The only person who stood up was Anaya Rasulullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anaya Rasulullah. And that is when Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he goes to fight Amr bin Abdawad, the Holy Prophet says, now observe the entirety of Iman is going to fight the entirety of Kufr. Kulla Iman is going against Kulla Kufr. This is the level of spiritual elevation. And then when Ali fights with him, you know the story, right? He spits on the face of Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He fits, spits on the face of Amirul Mu'mineen. Amirul Mu'mineen is about to just behead him. And he spits on the face of Amirul Mu'mineen. And what does Imam Ali do? He backs off. He backs off. Now tell me, if Ali would have finished Amr bin Abdawad at that time, what would have been the big deal? It'd be no big deal, man. He was a bad guy anyway, right? He had to die. Might as well just finish him off. Right? But Ali ibn Abi Talib wants to show us what is meant by spirituality. What is meant by spiritual elevation? When you are at a level of spiritual elevation, then every action that you carry out is not as a result of any anger or emotion. Every action is only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is fana. This is being annihilated in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what is meant you know, by dissolving in Allah. And this is what we learn in Karbala. In Karbala, we learn how companions and family members were annihilated in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were reaching that stage of annihilation. And it was the wali of that time, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, who was taking them in that journey from darkness into light. تسکیت النفس کی جب بات آتی ہے تو کربلا میں آپ کو بہت سی مثالیں ملیں گی لیکن آج جس شہید کی بات ہم کرنے والے ہیں آج جس شہید کی غم میں ہم رونے والے ہیں وہ معراج ہے تسکیت النفس کی معراج اور وہ ہے حسن کا لال حضرت قاسم امام حسن کا لال حضرت قاسم آشور کے دن ایک مرتبہ امام کے پاس آتے ہیں قاسم امام کے پاس آتا ہے آشور کے دن اور کہتا ہے چچا جان میں اجازت لینے کے لیے آیا ہوں میدان میں جانے کی اجازت چاہتا ہوں اب عبداللہ نے قاسم کو دیکھا اور کہا قاسم اب تو تو جوان بھی نہیں ہوا ہے تاریخ میں ملتا ہے کہ تقریباً تیرہ سال کی عمر ہوگی قاسم کی بارہ تیرہ سال کی اور امام نے انکار کیا کہ اجازت نہیں دے رہا ہوں ایک مرتبہ قاسم اپنی اممہ کے خیمے میں آتے ہیں اور کہتے ہیں اممہ میں چچا جان کے پاس جاتا ہوں لیکن چچا نے مجھے اجازت نہیں دی امم فروہ نے ایک مرتبہ فضا سے کہا فضا میری بینائی کمزور ہے ذرا حسین کو بلاو میرے پاس کہ میرے خیمے کے باہر آ جائے ایک مرتبہ امام الحسین ام فروہ کے خیمے کے باہر آتے ہیں اور ام فروہ نے امام حسین کو کہا کہ ابا عبداللہ کیا میرا قصور ہے کہ میں بیوہ ہوں کیا میرا قصور ہے کہ امام الحسن یہاں نہیں ہے کیونکہ وہ کہتے ہیں کہ اے امام آقا اگر آج حسن زندہ ہوتے تو آپ بھی محتاج ہیں اگر حسن زندہ ہوتے تو آپ بھی اجازت کے لیے محتاج ہوتے جب یہ کہا 
تو ایک مرتبہ قاسم کو یاد آیا کہ امام الحسن نے امام الحسن نے شہادت کے وقت قاسم کو ایک تعویز دیا تھا اب قاسم نے اس تعویز کو کھولا جب اس تعویز کو کھولا تو دیکھا کہ اس میں دو خطوط ہے ایک خط جو ہے وہ قاسم کے نام پہ تھا اور ایک خط ابا عبداللہ الحسین کے نام پہ تھا قاسم نے جب اپنا خط کھولا ہے تو امام الحسن کی وسیعت تھی قاسم ایک ایسا وقت آئے گا جب تم اپنے آپ میں جب تم اپنے آپ کو مشکل میں گرفتار سمجھو تب یہ خط ابا عبداللہ الحسین کو دے دینا اب قاسم مسکرائے خط لے کے ابا عبداللہ الحسین کے پاس آئے کہتا ہے چچا جان یہ خط لایا ہوں میرے بابا کا خط ہے ازادارو یہ موت کا تعویز تھا ایک مرتبہ ایک مرتبہ ابا عبداللہ الحسین نے خط لیا خط کو آنکھوں سے لگایا حسن کی تصویر سامنے آگئی بھائی کی وہ تصویر سامنے آئی کہ ہائے میرا بھائی جب ہم دفن کے لیے جا رہے تھے تو تیروں کی ایسی بارش ہوئی تھی کہ حسن کا لسن کی لاش تیروں سے پیوست ہو گئی تھی اب عبداللہ نے خط کو پرا جب امام الحسن نے خط میں کہا تھا اب عبداللہ میرے قاسم کو میری طرف سے قربان کر دینا مورخ لکھتے ہیں کہ امام امام الحسین نے اب قاسم کو تیار کیا لیکن مورک کہتے ہیں کہ قاسم کو اس طرح تیار کیا جیسے قاسم کو کفن پہنایا جاتا ہے قاسم کو کفن پہنایا جاتا ہے امام نے قاسم کو تیار کیا اب قاسم میدان کی طرف آئے ہیں ازادار و شہزادہ میدان کی طرف آیا ہے اب ابو الفضل عباس اور ابا عبداللہ الحسین کھرے ہیں خیمہ گاہ کی طرف اور دونوں جنگ دیکھ رہے ہیں حضرت قاسم کی جنگ دیکھ رہے ہیں ابا عبداللہ اور ابو الفضل حضرت قاسم کی جنگ دیکھ رہے ہیں قاسم میدان میں گیا عمر ابن سعید نے اس کے بہت بڑے بہادر ارزک شامی کو کہاں ارزک یہ قاسم آیا ہے میں چاہتا ہوں کہ تم جنگ کر کے قاسم کو شہید کر دو قاسم یا حسن کی نشانی کو مٹا دو ارزک شامی ایک مرتبہ ہس رہا ہے ہستا ہے اور کہتا ہے پسر ساد میرے چار جوان بیٹے ہیں میرے ایک بیرا ایک بیٹا جو ہے یہ حسن کی نشانی کے لیے کافی ہے ازادارو ارزک شامی کا پہلا بیٹا میدان میں آتا ہے ابو الفضل عباس نے اما عبداللہ سے کہا آقا دعا کرو میرے قاسم کے لیے اب قاسم نے ارزق کے پہلے بیٹے کو واصل جہنم کیا پھر ارزر کا دوسرا بیٹا آیا ابو الفضل عباس نے کہا آقا دعا کرو میرا قاسم میدان میں ہے قاسم نے ارزق کے دوسرے بیٹے کو بھی واصل جہنم کیا جب ارزق کا تیسرا بیٹا آیا ہے تو ابو الفضل نے کہا آقا میرا قاسم تین دن کا بھوکا اور پیاسا ہے میرا قاسم تین دن کا بھوکا اور پیاسا ہے دعا کرو قاسم نے ارزق کے تیسرے اور چوتھے بیٹے کو بھی واصل جہنم کیا جب ارزق شامی کے چار بیٹے واصل جہنم ہوئے ایک مرتبہ ارزق کو جلال آیا آگے خود بڑا اب عباس نے اب عبداللہ سے یہ نہیں کہا اب عبداللہ دعا کرو اب عباس نے اب عبداللہ سے کہا آقا اب ارزق کو کھو خود آیا ہے اب مجھے اجازت دو میں جاتا ہوں جنگ کر دیں میں جاتا ہوں جنگ کرنے کے لیے ازاداران حسین امام الحسین امام الحسین اب عبداللہ نے ایک مرتبہ اپنا رخ قیمگاہ کی طرف کہا کیا اور کہا ام فروہ کو ام فروہ کو بابی اب عرضہ کے شامی خود آیا ہے اب اپنے لال کے لیے دعا کرو ازادارو قاسم نے عرضہ کے شامی کو بھی واصل جہنم کیا جب عمر ابن سعید نے دیکھا 
کہا کہ قاسل نے سب, وا... سب کو واسل جہنم کیا ہے تو ایک مرتبہ اپنی فوج کو کہا قاسم کو گھیر لو اب قاسم کو لوگوں نے گھیر لیا ایک بہت بڑا ہجوم ہوا قاسم لڑ رہے ہیں قاسم کو سب نے گھیر لیا کسی نے قاسم کو اس قاسم کے سر پہ تلوار ماری قاسم گورے سے زمین پہ گرے جب گورے سے زمین پہ گرے ایک مرتبہ صدا بلند کی کہ میری مدد کے لیے آؤ چچا جان قاسم گورے سے زمین پہ گر گئے ازاداران حسین مورخ لکھتے ہیں مقتل میں ہے کہ امام اتنی تیزی سے گئے ہیں اتنی تیزی سے گئے ہیں کہ یزید کی فوج میں ایک ہلچل مچل گئی ازاداروں جب امام نے قاسم کی صدا سنی تھی تب قاسم قاسم تھا جب امام قاسم کی لاش پہ پہنچے ہیں تو قاسم تقسیم ہو گئے جب امام قاسم کی لاش پہ پہنچے تو قاسم تقسیم ہو گیا قاسم واحد شہید ہے جو پہلے شہادت سے پہلے گھوڑوں کی ٹاپوں سے قاسم کی لاش بامال ہو گئی ازاداروں ایک مرتبہ اب آپ دلہ نے کہا قاسم تو نہیں جانتا کہ میرے لیے کتنا مشکل تھا اب آپ دلہ نے کہا قاسم تو نہیں جانتا کہ میرے لیے کتنا مشکل تھا کہ تم نے آواز دی اور تیرا چچا وقت پہ نہ پہنچ سکا میرے لیے بہت ہی مشکل منظر تھا ازاداران حسین اب امام الحسین نے قاسم کی لاش کو خیمہ گاہ کی طرف لانے کی کوشش کی مقتل میں لکھا ہے کہ اب آپ دلہ الحسین نے قاسم قاسم کی لاش کو کیسے اٹھایا ہوگا اب آپ دلہ نے قاسم کے سینے کو اپنے سینے سے لگایا اور قاسم کو خیمہ گاہ کی طرف لے کے آئے اور مورخ لکھتے ہیں کہ ایک سینہ اب آپ دلہ کا تھا ایک سینہ قاسم کا تھا دونوں سینے ساتھ تھے لیکن قاسم کی لاش اس طرح سے پامال ہو گئی تھی کہ قاسم سیم کے پیر زمین کربلا میں گھسٹ رہے ہیں زاسیم کے پیر زمین کربلا میں گسر ایک مرتبہ قاسم خیمہ گاہ کی طرف آیا ہے قاسم کی لاش خیمہ گاہ کی طرف آیا ہے ام فروا نے فضا سے پوچھا فضا کیا میرا بیٹا شہید ہو گیا فضا نے کہا ہاں اب آپ دلہ آپ کے بیٹے کی لاش لے کے آئے ہیں اب وہ مقتل کہتا ہے کہ اب آپ دلہ نے قاسم کی لاش کو لیا علی اکبر کی لاش کے بالکل ساتھ میں رکھا اب علی اکبر ایک جگہ پہ ہے اس کے بالکل ساتھ قاسم ہے اب میرا مظلوم امام زمین کربلا میں بیٹھ گیا ایک ہاتھ قاسم کے سینے پہ رکھا ایک ہاتھ علی اکبر کے سینے پہ رکھا آسمان کی طرف اب آپ دلہ نے کہا بار الہا ارے پالنے والے تو گواہ رہنا حسین اپنے بچوں کی قربانی دے رہا اپنے بچوں کی قربانی دے رہا ہے یہ سننا تھا ام فروا باہر نکلی قاسم کی لاش کو دیکھا ایک مرتبہ قاسم کی لاش پہ گر گئی واہ قاسمہ واہ قاسمہ 